I will say first, for people who didn't read the description, by distributed, I mean people. Um, we do, do dis like all our computing is distributed across data centers and companies and public clouds and stuff, but I'm focusing on the fact that the people on our team are distributed, so just so you know ahead of time. <laughs> hey, my clicker doesn't work. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, as Amy mentioned, um, I work at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, that's one of the two companies that HP just became. Um, so the company that I went off with, with HPE, we do all the enterprise-y stuff. So that means the big servers, um, all the cloud stuff and everything. And then there's HP Inc, which <laughs> they sell ink. <laughs> 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 um, no, they do printers and consumer level laptops and desktops and stuff. Um, so I went off to the part of HP that does cloud. Um, in my role there, I'm kind of a donated systems engineer to the OpenStack project, so I don't actually do anything at HPE. I don't know anything about HPE. Don't ask me about our Helion product for OpenStack, because I really have no idea about anything about that. Um, I really only work on open source. Um, I've been contributing to open source projects um, for over a decade. Um, I've been on the Ubuntu Community Council for six years. Today's actually my last day, and there's an election going on to elect some new people. Um, so I've been doing a lot of open source stuff for a very long time, um, and I started getting paid for it um, at HP uh, three years ago when I was brought on board to work on OpenStack. Um, I'm also the co-author of the eighth edition of the official Ubuntu book, um, and I'm working on an OpenStack book right now, which will probably be released someday. <laughs> So a quick sort of overview of the talk. Um, I'm going to first sort of introduce our team and what we do, um, and then talk a little bit about the OpenStack uh, continuous integration system. Um, I will explain everything you need to know about OpenStack to understand our CI system, which is not very much. It's, it's a big project. Um, you don't need, really need to know anything about OpenStack for this talk. Um, and then I'll cover directly the code review, the automated testing, um, collaborative tools, and the communication methods we use. Um, if anyone has seen a, a talk I did about code review for systems administrators, um, there is some overlap with that talk, but this one I really wanted to focus on some of the soft skills and ways that we collaborate and communicate as a distributed team. So first, a little bit about how most open source projects do systems administration and infrastructure. Um, so there's usually a team that manages it, or they use something like GitHub. So GitHub can host your entire open source project. Um, you have code review, you have, or th there, are, there are mechanisms to do code review, there's mechanisms to run testing with third party things that hook into GitHub, and you can run everything on GitHub. Um, or there's a company that manages the system for you. Um, when I was working on Ubuntu, uh, that company was canonical, so in order to get anything changed in the Ubuntu infrastructure when we were doing development, um, we'd have to submit a ticket with canonical. Um, and that, even that was kind of distributed um, because I run a couple of the servers for the Ubuntu project, just personally, um, because uh, it's a way I can contribute. Um, so some people would come to me and ask me to make changes, some people go to canonical and ask them to make changes to things. Um, so in a lot of these cases, uh, in order to make a change to the infrastructure for the open source project, you need to file a bug or submit something to a ticketing system or send a mail to the mailing list. Um, and then the priority of your request is determined by the infrastructure team, uh, who is either internal to the company or someone working at GitHub. Um, it's not something that you can really influence um, unless you get Mark Shuttleworth on the phone, you know, in Ubuntu and say, hey, this is a big problem, we need to get fixed, and then he sends someone to do it. Um, and this, this is, sounds very similar to a lot of IT organizations, right? Like if there's a problem with the infrastructure or the build stuff, um, you have to go submit a ticket with IT, or you are IT and you are accepting tickets. The developers have absolutely no influence in fixing things. Um, so our question early on in the OpenStack project was whether that there was a better way. Um, we are an open source project. We weren't using code hosting. We were actually using all of our, all of our own stuff. Um, OpenStack is committed to only using open source software. Um, so people were submitting tickets to the project, and we're like, why are they submitting tickets? We should just open source every single thing in our infrastructure. So that's what we did. Um, as a little background to the team, um, we, by saying I work on the infrastructure, that means we run the continuous integration system, we run the wiki that the developers use, we run all the IRC bots that sit in channels, um, and a lot of the etherpads, paste bins, everything developers interact with. 
and as I said, um, all of our configurations are now open source. Um, they went open source shortly after the project began, so they've been out there for probably about four years now. Um, and anyone in the world can view all of this and submit patches to our infrastructure. Um, this means that developers are no longer beholden to the core people on the team, those of us who have root and approval access to make changes. They can, anyone can propose changes to our infrastructure. Um, and we wrote a, a manual so that they can figure out how to do that. Um, and then our team itself, um, we're distributed worldwide across several different companies. So I'm from HPE, um, myself and Yolanda are both working at HP and we're both core and root admins on this system. Uh, we have contributors from IBM, uh, Rackspace, uh, Mirantis, and then several people from a bunch of other companies who may not have root and core on all the systems, um, but they are developers and systems administrators who submit patches to us regularly. And those are companies across the OpenStack uh, ecosystem. So hundreds of companies contribute to OpenStack, <laughs> Lots of people contributing to our infrastructure. And additionally, if their boss thinks something that needs something thinks something needs to be done in our infrastructure, they can donate sysadmins to our team to work with us for a little while to get a feature implemented. They don't need to ask us permission, they just need to pay someone to do the work. So this is not really an important slide that you understand everything we run. Um, it's just sort of uh, what we run. You know, we run a bunch of services for the OpenStack project. Um, this uh, board was something we put together at a sprint because we were trying to figure out everything we run because we hadn't really documented it very well. Um, I'm happy to say we have now, so everything on this scribbly board is now documented. And for every single service, we have a page describing how it's set up and the links to all the configuration, which I'll get to a bit later. Um, so a lot of these services look, probably look familiar to you. Um, they're all open source services. Um, a lot of infrastructures use them. Um, so there's nothing really revolutionary or anything here as far as the software that we're specifically using. For OpenStack itself, uh, we found that we needed to develop a continuous integration system because OpenStack is huge. There are now over 800 projects that make up OpenStack. Um, all of these projects have to work together, so integration testing is very, very important. Um, if someone makes a change to the networking component of OpenStack, that can't break the compute project, because if that happens, then OpenStack is broken. And if someone at IBM does that, then someone at some other company might be upset that they now broke all of OpenStack for all of their developers. So there are some politics involved. We can't have one company breaking trunk for everyone else, so we have to make sure that all changes are tested before they are merged into the repository. Um, we also had to make sure that since we, again, have all these developers working on this from lots of different companies, that all the code that goes into OpenStack is syntactically clean. So we tend to go by uh, Google's Python standards for writing code, um, and then we do a lot of um, linting and, and also automated tests with Python tooling um, to make sure that everything is working and everything looks good. Um, and of course, Testing has to be completely automated. Um, there is no manual process in any of our testing infrastructure uh, because we process thousands of changes per day and run tens of thousands of tests against those changes. So nothing manual in the process. Um, results of the tests just have to be returned to the developer for review and everything has to work. Um, so I'm talking about the OpenStack CI system in general. This is what all the developers use for OpenStack and I and we happen to use it too, but just hold tight while I talk about this. Um, so the tooling we're using for CI, um, you may notice some, some, some things on here you're familiar with, Jenkins. Um, it is still what we use for CI. Uh, we're hoping to get rid of Jenkins in our infrastructure because we kind of just use it as a shim to pass on jobs. Um, we don't really use any of the internal Jenkins stuff. We don't use any Jenkins plugins. Um, it really is just like a, a queue holder. Um, but we use a open launchpad for uh, authentication. Um, that's kind of a historical thing that we still are kind of stuck with until OpenStack ID is ready. We have some developers working on a new ID system. Um, we're using Git. Um, we actually have mirrors of all of our repositories to GitHub. That's also historical and I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> um, but we have git.openstack.org. That's actually our canonical resource for things. Um, Garrett is used for code review. Um, that's a giant Python, or sorry, uh, Java project developed by Google. Uh, it's what they use for Android. It's what they move to for Chromium. 
Um, and so we're using a version of Garrett. Um, and we're happy to say that we're the largest public Garrett in the world. So people are using it internally at their companies, but we're the biggest one that's public, um, which makes for interesting problems with security and other things. And when we find bugs, we really find bugs. <laughs> um, we wrote a few tools ourselves and used some tools that were developed by people on our team. So we use a tool called Zool, which takes, reads everything that comes from Garrett and sends it up to Gearman, which then sends things off to our Jenkins builders um, to run the jobs. Um, this is all documented, so I'm not going to go very deep into all of these things because it's not really that important. Um, but we are running this full continuous integration system against tens of thousands of patches a day, uh, hundreds of thousands of patches in a release cycle that's six months long. Um, and if you want to look into any more of this to replicate a fully open source infrastructure, CI system, um, you can take a look at that. Um, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is a node pool, and that's something that our team also developed, which handles our fleet of virtual machines that all the testing is done on. So when Jenkins wants to run a test, it looks to node pool for an available um, VM to run the test on. Um, we used to do it with a bunch of cron scripts, so like we'd query OpenStack, because all of our clouds we work with are OpenStack clouds, of course. Um, queries OpenStack and sees whether a system is running a test or whether it needs to kill it. Um, but NodePool is now a daemon that does this all the time, instead of every 15 minutes um, doing a Reaper. Um, so that's our, our stack of CI. Um, if you're interested in how this works from a uh, uh, perspective of infrastructure, I don't know how well you can read this, um, but as a developer or one of us, uh, you write changes on your little desktop, uh, you send them up to code review, it goes off to Zool and Gearman and Jenkins. Jenkins sends them all off to different slaves to run jobs. Uh, and then the results come back to Garrett. Once it's in Garrett, that's usually when the human developers start reviewing the code, because uh, most developers won't review code if the tests don't pass, because there's no sense in doing that, because if the tests don't pass, then the code will never merge, and you probably don't want to do review yet. Um, it does allow people to get help when their tests aren't, when their work isn't passing. They're like, they just throw it up into Garrett and say, this isn't going to pass the test, but can someone look at this and help me figure out why it's not passing tests? Um, so it's in Garrett, it gets code reviewed. Once everyone looks at it and it gets approved, it then goes through the CI system again before it's actually merged. Um, and Zool has some interesting um, visualizations as to making sure that all of the code is tested together, which I can actually show you uh, if I have internet here. Stop. Ah. So. Let's see how this goes. Um, so this is a status.openstack.org slash Zool, and it's not going. All right. Well, trust me, there's a very pretty graphic that uh, <laughs> it sort of looks like a subway station map where like Zool will, will show you what, what your patch is dependent upon. And then if, if it's something it depends on fails to merge, um, it'll skip to the next patch. Um, but the point of Zool is to make sure that all the patches are merged in, in a certain order to make sure that everything is working against each other. Um, so you don't merge two conflicting patches. Um, that's something we learned really, really early on in the OpenStack project with the pace of development is that it can, even if a merge conflict only happens one in 100 times, that means it's happening to us like 100 times a day. So um, we had to make sure we had Zool to work on that. So why do you care about this whole CI system? Um, the reason you should care in this talk is because our infrastructure team uses it as well, and it is a core part of the technological things that we do in order to make our team work. We also have automated tests for our infrastructure, and these are always growing. Um, so since OpenStack's all written in Python, all of our system scripts are either written in Bash or Python. Uh, so we have a, uh, use Flake 8, which does PEP 8 and PyFlakes testing for like syntax and really basic um, sort of unit testing inside of Python. Um, we use Puppet in our infrastructure. Um, it's not because we love Puppet. Who loves their configuration management system? <laughs> Um, it's, I think it was because we got it installed faster than Chef or something at the time. Um, so. <laughs> um, so we use Puppet, and since we use Puppet, we're using Puppet Parser Validate to validate our, the syntax and our things, using Puppet Lint to make sure all of our 
config files look the same. So we have standard indentation and standard commas and making sure everyone's writing the things the same way so that we can all read each other's public configs. Um, we also started doing using um, Beaker RSpec in order to do actual testing of the public configs on a VM. So the tests are now done to make sure the puppet, not, not only that it looks syntactically clean and looks like it probably will work, we actually test to make sure that it does work. And then we write a bunch of tests inside of that to test everything to make sure we're testing the right things. Um, so that's actually pretty new and it's, it's exciting and I break it all the time. Um, <laughs> Uh, we also uh, know the syntax of some of our X XML files, uh, so we can run XML checks against those files. So if a developer comes along and adds their project to our infrastructure or does something um, and it breaks the XML, which is about to break our entire infrastructure, we can now detect that through automated tests. Um, we also learned pretty early on that humans are really bad at the alphabet, so we, uh, we make computers make sure that files are alphabetized for us, because um, they do that better than we do. Um, and one of the things that, that is really fun, funny is that we run all the IRC bots, all the official bots for the OpenStack project. And one of the things we, were, we had to do for a while was every time someone submitted a change, we had to say, in the review, can you please add the OpenStack infra account you know, in, in ChanServe to the channel as well? Um, and we added it to documentation, but who reads that? So we created a test. Um, we have a little bot that hops on Freenode, queries ChanServe to make sure that our account is added, and if not, the test fails and their code will never be merged. So we're doing a lot to pass everything we can off to the robots so we don't need to say the same thing in reviews a lot of times. Um, and since I was the one who was usually reviewing the IRC patches, that means I have to do less work, yay. <laughs> So that's sort of the technical side of part of how we, we collaborate. Um, but peer review using Garrett is, is also a huge part of, of making sure this infrastructure works for us. So automated tests are awesome. Um, peer review is even better. Um, none of the patches that land in our infrastructure can go in without peer review. So technically, you can submit a patch and self-approve it if you're a core member. But you're not going to be a core member for very long if you do that, because you'll get in trouble. <laughs> um, we, keep, and we trust each other. That's why we have core reviewers. They're people who've been with the project for a few years, and we trust them. Um, but we have a policy of making sure someone submits the code. It doesn't matter anyone in the world, core reviewer, someone off the street. Um, they have to have two core reviewers review the code, um, not enforced by technical policy, but by social policy You know, before we approve it. Um, so for every change to our infrastructure, we have a couple of people looking at it. Um, it also turns out to be a really good framework for developing new solutions. So I will sometimes spend a day spinning my wheels on something, and I'll be halfway through it and getting stuck, and I'll just throw it up on Garrett and mark it as a work in progress, and I'll hop on IRC and I'll say, hey guys, can you please take a look at this change, because I'm halfway through it, but I don't know where to go from here. And the cool thing about Garrett is it allows for inline commenting, which I'll show you later, um, and other things that make it really easy to collaborate through the Garrett interface in code review. Um, you don't really need any special process for commit access, because anyone can propose a change. Um, there is the whole core reviewer thing, which means you can approve changes, but that's, it's less formal, and it's something that comes after usually a, a year at least of working on the project. Um, it took me two years to get core reviewer on OpenStack Infra. That's partially because I go to conferences all the time and I talk about it instead of <laughs> reviewing a lot of changes. Um, so it depends on the person and their workload and what they're working on. Um, but we definitely put a very high value on reviewing each other's changes in our team. Reviewing each other's changes is how you get on the path to becoming a root admin on everything, which is exciting, right? No, it's. It's a big responsibility, but <laughs> the bosses like it. Um, it also puts us in a frame of mind that when we need to do things outside of our code review system, we're already really used to working with each other. Um, we've all commented on each other's patches. Uh, we've all worked with each other to develop solutions. And so we're all very used to working with each other anyway. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, since anyone can contribute patches, that means any company can devote engineers to work on our team. So if you want to add a new feature to our infrastructure, um, one of them was uh, someone at Red Hat wanted to add an asterisk server to the OpenStack project. 
And I, I've worked with asterisks before, and I never want to do it again. So, <laughs> uh, so we were like, you know, if you want that, then you can just come and build it. So a couple of engineers from Red Hat spent a few weeks and brought up an asterisk server, which now works. I think it's on CentOS 6, so it works arguably. Um, <laughs> but um, that was an instance of, and this happens all the time, where companies will come in and they'll devote engineers for a few weeks to build something, and then every time it breaks, we just call them again and say, oh, by the way, the asterisk server's been down for a few days. Someone want to look at that, because we're not committed to maintaining this. You guys brought it up. So um, it allows companies to directly influence what we're working on in our infrastructure by giving us more manpower or people power. Ah, yes, so I mentioned Garrett inline comments. I don't know if you can see this, but it's really funny. I, it's one of my changes. And in my change, I said, if robots text equals, no, does not equal undefined. <laughs> and he, he's like, you can probably just get rid of the not equals undefined there. <laughs> wow, I must not have slept. <laughs> um, but there was, you know, you can do inline comments. Um, and it's, it's actually pretty nice when you do something stupid like that. And your colleague can be like, well, this will work, but it's kind of stupid. <laughs> um, it sort of goes hand in hand with everything we're doing that we also do automated deployment. So we're continuously delivering everything on our infrastructure. So a change gets approved. It goes through all that testing stuff with Zool and Jenkins and all that. And then it lands in trunk and that's immediately put into production. Um, and our, our theory here is that we tested it so it should totally work. Uh, <laughs> that's mostly true. <laughs> um, we, we do have the benefit of having our customers be developers on the OpenStack project. Um, so they're slightly more forgiving than, say, a customer who's paying you money. Um, but it works. It actually works pretty well for us. We don't have catastrophic failures all that often. <laughs> OpenStack development pretty much keeps going. Um, and we don't really have a lot of big problems. Um, the deployment's done either just through Puppet, because Puppet's always pulling from Trunk, or we have um, a module in Puppet that will update um, the Git repository of the software that it's pulling from whenever that software is updated. So after I tell everyone all of this, um, how I was a sysadmin for two years without ever logging into a server, people say, Liz, that sounds ridiculous. I need to log into my servers. I won't feel like a real sysadmin if I'm not at the command prompt. And I'm like, well, it was a nice vacation. <laughs> Um, but no, actually, it, it works. Like, I, I didn't really feel that disconnected from our systems not being able to log in. Um, it is actually possible to manage systems just through code review um, and a few tools that we've put together um, to make it easier. So we've got Cacti running. And I'll mention right now that this is the only monitoring that we have. Um, we don't have any active monitoring. Um, and that's partially because no one has paid us to do it yet, um, partially because since our, our users are more forgiving, uh, none of their companies apparently see the need to spend money on mo active monitoring yet. So we learn when either we look at cacti or people drop into channel and say, hey, this thing is broken. Um, or we're all at a conference and the CI system grinds to a halt because our log server filled up again. It's not great, um, but again, we're an open infrastructure and if a company feels that we're not paying much attention to that portion of our infrastructure, monitoring. Um, they can pay someone to hold a pager, because that's not my job. <laughs> um, so anyway, so we use Cacti for monitoring. Um, and uh, you've probably all seen Cacti. Um, but it's, it's really helpful for us when someone doesn't have access to a server, but they're interested in either current server statistics or how we launched a service. So they want to know, we're running Garrett. They want to know what size server we put it on. We say, why don't you go look at Cacti? You can see all of the statistics from that server. You can see how much RAM it has, how much RAM is actually used. Maybe we put it on a server that's too big, which is impossible for Garrett, it turns out. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, it, allows, it also allows us to make intelligent decisions. So before I had access to the servers, I could look at static.openstack.org and see if I wanted to launch a new web service on that. Because uh, maybe I was worried about it using too much RAM or that the cron job was going to destroy the machine's processor. But I could look at Cacti and make an informed decision without having to bother my colleagues and say, what server should I put this on? Um, I could sort of decide for myself, toss up a code review, and if they told me to put it on another server, that's fine. Um, but I don't need hand-holding in order to make that initial attempt at a patch. 
Uh, we also use a tool called Puppet Board. Um, it, there are a few dashboards in the Puppet community. Uh, usually they have one developer and that developer then has a life event. <laughs> And then we have to switch to another one. Um, so we were using Puppet Dashboard for a while. We switched to Puppet Board. I think this developer actually just left for a while. We may need to switch to another one. But the idea is that we wanted a public dashboard that anyone can see our changes in Puppet on. So if they submit a patch, and after an hour or so goes by, after the patch is approved and merged, they don't see a change on the server, they can go to Puppet Board, which is just at uh, puppetdb.openstack.org. Excuse me. Um, and they can see why their change didn't merge. Um, they can see the errors um, without having to bother, again, someone who can log into a server and look at the syslog. So we don't need to log in and say, oh, it failed because of this, and paste it to them. They can just look at Puppet Board. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a change because I was doing this um, on a Friday afternoon when we weren't making changes. Um, but this is sort of like the, the dashboard. And then you click on these things, and you can see latest reports and what's changed. Um, and this is probably one of the most powerful tools before I got access to the servers, because I was making a bunch of changes. My change would land, and I'd be like, did that apply? I don't know. I can look at Puppet Board and see if it's gone in yet. Um, we also have a strong commitment to documentation, um, which our bosses let us do. Yay. <laughs> um, so every system that we have um, has documentation on docs.openstack.org. So if you're interested in how we've configured Garrett, um, you can see all you can see links to all of our puppet configs and all our configuration files in the page that we have about Garrett. Um, same goes for our paste bin and our IRC bots. Again, it's all open source, so we try to make it make it as replicatable as possible and to document how to replicate our setup. Um, and every time I come to a conference, I learn something that wasn't documented. So it turns out that I have been the owner of renaming channels on Freenode for our team. So I actually just submitted a patch this week to write, put in the documentation for how to rename a channel and forward all traffic on Freenode, because it's non-trivial. Um, so now it's documented, so I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> I probably will, but uh, when I'm gone, someone else can do it. So we love documentation. I spend a lot of time on documentation, actually more than I ever have before. But you can't do everything through git commits, it turns out. Um, automation is not perfect, especially when we're using Puppet Agent. Those things die all the time. So sometimes you need to log into a server. Um, one of the other big things we need to log into servers for is um, making changes to databases. Um, the web tools for MySQL are universally terrible and we won't use them. So the only way to talk to MySQL is by logging into a server that can log into MySQL and using MySQL at the command line to query data databases and make changes, which means we need to log into a server. Um, we only have the MySQL client installed on a few servers, because um, usually they're using some sort of um, uh, Python tooling or something to connect to MySQL, so they don't need the client. Um, but we do need to log into a server to work with our databases. Um, we also do some complicated migrations and things sometimes. So when we wanted to replace our Garrett server, we determined that doing an in-place upgrade was not the thing we were going to do. We were going to launch a new server and then move over, do a, a migration over to that. In that case, you can't really do that through code review. Um, we had to have a sort of all hands on deck thing where we all work together, which I'll talk about more. Um, and work through a few of the manual components, because we hadn't done it that many times, so we hadn't automated the process of doing an upgrade. And since it's a major central part of the OpenStack project, we wanted to make sure it was done right. Um, one of the things that I'm not too happy about is we still have a manual process when we bring up a new static server in our infrastructure. Um, so when I was at the OpenStack Summit a couple weeks ago, I launched codesearch.openstack.org. And that just means I spent an hour going through our script of how to launch a new server in Rackspace's cloud, and then I made sure all the Puppet stuff went to it. Um, we want to automate a lot of that, because um, it's, it's way too manual right now. Um, but we still have manual components to that. Um, and then, of course, passwords need to be privately managed. Um, we love openness, but a open source project will not be successful if everyone can log into your servers and change everything in Git. So. Um, we do have our passwords privately managed by a core group of people, um, but they're stored in, in a private Git repo, so at least we've got history and stuff. So um, there's that. You know, so SSH keys and other things go into that as well. So I mentioned that for complicated things like 
upgrades and, and migrations and, and other things. Um, we need to collaborate. And this is a screenshot from something we did last week. Um, what were we doing? Oh, we were doing some renames of projects. Um, so Garrett doesn't make renames easy at all. And in OpenStack, people just love renaming their projects. I don't know. <laughs> so we have an, a, a rename window um, every, it used to be more often, um, but we, we have a rename window. We've been having them every month or so. And it actually means Garrett downtime, which is no fun, but Garrett doesn't really scale horizontally. So we don't have much of a choice there until Garrett gets better. Um, but what we do when we do have to do a manual project or migration, or in this case, a rename of some of the projects, we set aside a maintenance window, inform the project. Um, we do this all on our work time, like nine to five time partially because OpenStack is an international project and it doesn't matter when we do it, it's always going to be someone's production time. And partially because we have a culture on our team where we value our time. And that doesn't mean there aren't workaholics, but if you're not one, you're not really penalized on our team. So I don't wanna work after five, okay, I'm not working after five. So we plan our maintenance windows together and then we're all sitting on IRC and we have an etherpad up. So this etherpad has all of the manual steps in it and then we all put our names next to what we're going to do. So we're chatting on IRC, we're putting our names in the etherpad, and we all have really grown up IRC nicknames. There's Fungi, I'm Pilea2, there's Nibbleizer. <laughs> um, so anyway, so we've all got our IRC nicks in there, and we all work together like, hey, I completed step number two, we type done in the etherpad, we mention it in channel, and we just work through this. Um, until the job is done, if something breaks, um, we'll paste some output in a in a paste bin, we'll paste it in channel, or we'll put it in the etherpad, and we'll work through debugging each step together if something goes wrong. Um, so not, none of us are alone in this process, even though uh, Jeremy lives in North Carolina, and I live in San Francisco, and uh, Nibbleizer lives up in Portland, Oregon. Um, even though we're not together, um, we are all working through this process together um, in IRC and in the etherpad. Um, and again, everyone can see all this stuff. Our IRC channel is publicly logged, and anyone can join the channel. Um, our core team is about 10 people, and I think there are 400 people in our infrastructure channel. So there's lots of people watching what we're doing. <laughs> Which brings me to sort of the human collaboration part of, of how we do all of this stuff. So we have a main IRC channel, the OpenStack Infra channel, um, and all of this is logged. So if someone falls off IRC for some reason, um, they can go back and read the logs. Um, if we're looking for historical context of why a change was made and someone wrote a really bad commit message, uh, we can look in IRC and find the conversation where it was talked about. Um, we also have a specific incident channel. So if something goes terribly wrong with our infrastructure and people are bugging us to review their patches in the main channel, we'll all just move over to the incident channel and it completely ignore the main channel. So we're all focused on fixing that incident and no one will bother us because they don't know about that channel. <laughs> um, and we just focus on fixing whatever's gone wrong. Um, we also use the OpenStack Sprint channel. We were actually the ones who created it. Um, and that's for sprinting on a specific topic. So over the summer, we were doing a big refactor of some of our Puppet modules. So we just spent two days in the OpenStack Sprint channel focused specifically on that thing. Um, and we do this for various topics. Um, we also have uh, weekly IRC-based meetings in the OpenStack meeting channel. So just like other projects in OpenStack, we have an hour-long meeting where we sync up on our priority efforts, make sure everyone is on track, and if they need help or if we need to discuss any important issues, that's a time when everyone on the team should probably be at that meeting or at least reading the logs. Um, so it's if you can't read all of OpenStack Infra, which I don't even do, um, at least if you go to the meetings, you can learn about what we're doing and sort of keep up with, with the important things that are happening in the project. Um, I mentioned we have channel logs, so all of our logs are on eavesdrop.openstack.org. Um, it's a, actually an OpenStack project policy now that all project channels have to be logged. Uh, we have a paste bin, so if we have an error and we are not able to figure out what's wrong, um, we can just paste it in the paste bin and share the link and channel. Um, and then the last one here about meeting in person is something that I've come to value very, very highly. Um, it's easy for me to stand here and say that as a distributed team, we work perfectly all the time and it's great to collaborate online um, and everything's great. Um, but it turns out we actually do need in-person time. Um, 
we don't use voice or video calls, um, partially because none of us want to. Plus, we're in our pajamas all day. Um, <laughs> so the getting together um, in person when we're all in the same time zone is really valuable for our team. We can walk through, we can work our way through high bandwidth discussions. Um, we can go out for drinks or desserts or whatever we want to do and, and sort of socialize with each other and build up team cohesion. Because uh, the social aspect of this turns out to be really important. Um, when you're reviewing someone's code, if you are in a bad or sad mood and you read a negative comment, if you don't know that person, you could be like, wow, what a jerk. <laughs> but if you know them, you may be like, oh yeah, I did something stupid and they made a good comment. So the in-person events, either at the OpenStack Summit or team sprints that we have some years um, it, that are in-person um, are really, really important to our team. So I wish I could say we do everything remotely, but we do meet up sometimes and that's really important. So if you have a team that's distributed, I highly recommend bringing them together at least uh, once or twice a year, um, even if it's not to work. Um, or work in the day and play at night, or have some, some activities where you're actually getting out and working together and getting to know your teammates. And the sad thing is there's also this time zone problem that we have that we haven't done a very good job of sol solving. Um, it's great to have increased coverage. So our team is distributed all around the world. Most of us are in the US just because of reasons. Um, but we have a contributor in Russia, one in Spain, and one in uh, Australia. And they have a really hard time when they were starting. So the guy in Russia and the guy in Australia, they're, they're totally not on the same time zone, but they're closer than some of us. Um, so they would sometimes work together, um, but the first person in a region has a really tough time on our team. Um, they usually don't really feel cohesion with the rest of the team, because the guy in Australia, there's no way he's ever gonna make it to our team meeting, because it's at like 3 a.m. Um, and he should probably be sleeping. Um, he sometimes makes it, <laughs> poor guy. Um, it, they also have sort of a, a decreased, you know, more reluctance to push things into production because they're the only one around. Um, so they're not going to push something and break something because then they're the only one around to fix it. Um, and it's slower to onboard these people when, they bring, when we bring them onto the main team just because we aren't around to show them the secret passwords file and you know, how we launch a server over here and other things that need to be done by the root folks. Um, the only solution we found to this is increasing coverage in their time zone, so they're no longer alone. So when we add the, added the root admin in Spain, when she came on, it was much easier for the Australian because now they could work together before all the Americans wake up. Um, and so that's sort of going in the direction of helping, um, but we haven't really found a very good solution to the time zone situation. Um, but mostly, things are, are pretty good. Um, and we're actually hiring for roles on my team, so if anyone's interested, um, you can email me at my HPE email address. Uh, that is my real email address, the one I actually check every day and use, and then I've got my work email address, which I, I actually don't have the certificate for Outlook to like read it this week, so I, <laughs> oops. Um, so I check that sometimes, uh, but if you wanna contact me, use the Princess Leia address. And you can grab me on Freenode, and that's a link to our documentation. Um, I think I've got, yeah, a few minutes for questions. Um, if you want to use the microphone, so recording and everything. I also have some t-shirts, and so I don't interrupt Lee's lightning talks. I'll be at, out, out the door over there after the talk, if anyone wants. I was curious, when you're troubleshooting problems, do you cut and paste in the pastebin, to the channel, any pair programming going on? Um, so we used, uh, yeah, we used Pastebin. Uh, we use a, a version of Pastebin called Logit. Um, and then uh, we'll paste the link into channel. Um, but also, since we're using a code review system, we're using Garrett, if we really need to do some like pair programming or working together on something, we'll just upload it to Garrett and say, this is totally not ready to be merged. Don't merge this, it's totally broken, but let's do some review and help each other on this, this patch. Uh, so I just have a couple questions, and, and if anyone else comes, they, they can, I can rotate out. Uh, what are you replacing Jenkins with? I'm sorry? What, what do you intend on replacing Jenkins with? Ah, that is an excellent question. So we're actually working on expanding Zool to encompass handling all of what Jenkins does. Because right now, Zool is really the thing that makes all the decisions. Um, it knows what patches to test against each other. It has definitions for all the jobs. And all Jenkins has is like a bash script, and a, it knows to talk to node pool. So we're trying to pull all those things into Zool and make Zool a full replacement for the little shim stuff that Jenkins does. 
Um, do you, for emergency changes, do you still do two-man roll, or, or do you guys, if there's a break fix situation, do you immediately? Uh, I'm, I'm, if, if there's an emergency, uh, uh, emergency situation, yes. then, yeah. Yeah, we will, we will self-approve or single core approve if there is an emergency. Um, and we'll, we'll, say it, we'll mention it in channel. So we'll say, I'm self-approving this, but um, yeah, they just make sure they notify us. So with kind of letting anyone come in and say, hey, we want to stand up an asterisk server or something, do you have a problem with you know, standing it up and then it becomes abandonware and then all of a sudden there's some exploit that's, you know, you're turning in your infrastructure into a botnet? How yeah, do you manage that? We turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> and if someone wants to bring it back, they can. But yeah, it's, it's turned off if no one's around. Yeah. Not sure if you've done the Puppet 3 to Puppet 4 upgrade yet, um, but uh, okay, cool. All right, I can tell you don't have the, the, the bags under your eyes yet. Uh, but I noticed from upgrade to upgrade, um, there's variations in the Puppet parser. How, how are you guys handling, um, like, having to go back and retrofit all the modules uh, per upgrade? Are you, do you ensure backward compatibility through just adding additional parsers? Or? I'm really glad you asked that, because when we did the Puppet 2 to Puppet 3 migration, um, we learned two weeks before Puppet 2 was going out of, was being end of life, we're like, oh, we need to upgrade to Puppet 3. We were not at all ready for it. Like we got it done before the end of life, but that was a disaster. So we have already started adding the parser validate tests for Puppet 4 on all of our code now. So when Puppet 4 comes out, it won't work, but it probably should work, and it has passed all the tests. So that's a very good question. We, yay, we're going to do it right this time. <laughs> and the last question is, can I get an email address with your domain? Huh? Uh, Princess <laughs> No. <laughs> Do you find that wearing pajamas increase your productivity? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's easier to get to work in the morning. <laughs> I don't know. You know, some, some people say that you know, they want to get dressed up and, and, and be formally going to work um, in the morning. And some of the people on our team do. Um, I usually don't, unless I need to go out somewhere. Um, it really depends on the person. The person needs to decide that for themselves, really. Uh, I think I'll do one more question, then we'll set up for, for lightning talks. Here. Actually, I was just going to say thank you and close thing off so uh, oh, we could start great. setting up for the lightning talk. So thank you very much. All right, thanks.